Hello everyone and welcome to our family conference. Uh, thank you for tuning in tonight. Uh, we get to hear from Brother Dufour. I'm looking forward to hearing this myself. Uh, I've not watched it yet and so uh, I'm encouraged to hear from someone that knows a lot about the family and uh, we can certainly learn from him. Um, at this very moment uh, we are videoing right now at the church and uh, we're going to be uh, just uh, videoing Brother Jones, and he's going to preach to a studio audience, and we we're going we're to be showing that to you later, and so uh, just make sure that you don't miss it. Tune in every night of the family conference. It'll be great. God bless you all.
takes care of me. Friends at Old Time Baptist Church and those that might be watching via internet, uh, it's a privilege to be part of your Family Life Conference this year. I've been looking forward to this since I was asked last year to, to be part of it, and I uh, didn't really expect it to be this way, but God knows exactly what's going on. He's got us in the palm of his hand. Uh, he knows exactly what's happening. God, You know, God's not nervous about this thing at all. But my prayer is with you and your church as you make decisions. And uh, I pray for you all out there in New York. Uh, Michigan is having its own problems with our governor and a set of circumstances. And obviously, so are you and so many others across the country. I pray that God would give each of us wisdom on how to deal with our governments and deal with our communities and to deal with our churches. But I uh, wanted to just, uh, uh, I, I asked, what, what would you like me to speak on? And the answer that I received is something to do with parenting or marriage. Well, that's a pretty general 
topic. So what I did is I just sought the Lord and waiting for God to lay something on my heart. And I believe that God has laid this message on my heart for our families, for our marriages, for our child rearing, for our churches. So let's take our Bibles, if you would, please, and turn to Mark chapter 15. Mark chapter 15. As you folks know, a big part of my heart resides right there in Hamburg, the Lackawanna area. Thank you for allowing me to be part of this. And uh, I certainly do love you and I love your pastor and your church. And many of you are good friends of mine. So Mark chapter 15, Mark chapter 15. And I'm going to get a little bit of historical context here on what we're looking at in Mark chapter 15 and then make some practical applications as far as our families go. In Mark chapter 15, we see, of course, it's dealing with the, the crucifixion and Christ uh, going to the cross. And look in verse 20. And when they had mocked him, they took of the purple from him and put his own clothes on him and led him out to crucify him. Can you just imagine the scene here, friends? It's unthinkable. Like any time that I think about it, I can't help but be emotional of what Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ went through for me. And I personalize it. I very much so personalize this. He didn't just go through this for the world in general. He went through this for Jeff Dufour in particular, specifically. So my, my, my heart is moved when I read this, how they, uh, they smote him on the head and they spit upon him and they yanked out his beard and they had the purple robe upon him and uh, after they had beaten him, and then they tore that purple robe off, even with all the clotted blood and such on his back from the beating that he had received. Look in verse 20. Oh, we just read 20. Look in verse 21. Now he's on the road till Golgotha. And in verse 21, and they compel one Simon, a Cyrenian, who passed by coming out of the country, the father of Alexander and Rufus, to bear his cross. Let me read that last part again. I'll read the verse. And they compel one Simon, a Cyrenian, who passed by coming out of the country, the father of Alexander and Rufus, to bear his cross. Now let's look over in Romans chapter 16. In Romans chapter 16, we see a name come up again. And look in chapter 16, verse 13. Romans chapter 16. I hope you're looking along with me in your Bible. When it's a video conference, it's sometimes easy to get lethargic and to not pay attention, I certainly hope that you will follow along with me and read in your Bible. Romans chapter 16. Now, you know, the book of Romans was written by the Apostle Paul to the church at Rome. And much of our Bible doctrine is found in the book of Romans. What a rich book. But then we get to chapter 16 and we see salutations where he's saying to salute this one and salute another. I've got a whole series of Sunday school lessons on saluting the brethren. And we look down into verse 13 of Romans chapter 16. The scripture here says, Salute Rufus, chosen in the Lord, and his mother and mine. Rufus. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, bless our time together. Teach us from your word. God, oh God, teach us from your word. God, if there's ever a time that our families need help, it's today. It's right now. It's right this moment. It's right this very second. Our homes, our families are in crisis. Our communities are in crisis. Our nation, our world is in crisis. So God, I pray that you would speak to our hearts through your word. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We see there in verse 13 of Romans chapter 16, it says, Salute Rufus, chosen in the Lord. I used to remember years ago 
probably not the best of programming to be watching, but I remember Hee Haw. Some of you remember Hee Haw. I guess I got some of my Hee Haw outfit on. I should have had my bib overalls on. But, uh, uh, and they would have a time where they would say, salute. They would say, we're going, today we're going to salute such and such a, a, a community in such and such a state. And it's usually some little uh, population, 237. And everybody would stand up in the cornfield and they would say, salute. And then they'd go back down into the cornfield. I remember that. Uh, but this is what's happening, not necessarily in that fashion. I can't imagine the Apostle Paul doing that. But in Romans chapter 16, the Apostle Paul is naming some folks, uh, folks that uh, he wanted to get a message to, salute. In other words, say, say howdy to. I want to recognize them. I'm, I'm, I'm waving to them. I'm showing honor to them. I, I, I'm association with them. And he says, salute Rufus, chosen in the Lord. Now, friends, I want my family to be chosen of the Lord. It is a prayer, maybe not this ex these exact words, but something very similar to this. I've prayed thousands of times in my life, dear Lord, please choose my children. I'm honored and blessed to have the children that I have. I'm honored and blessed to have the in-laws that I have. I have four amazing sons-in-law and one amazing daughter-in-law. And as of the recording of this, I have 10 grandchildren and four on the way. I am looking for, by the end of the summer, we'll have 14 grandchildren. I'm just excited about that. My grandson Connor is 10 years old and he, he comes about up to here on me. I kept, he said, Papa, I'm almost as tall as you. And I just told him, I said, son, that's no great feat. Okay, that's no great feat. But he is a big kid. These are my kids. These are my grandkids. My life revolves around my grandkids. It revolves around my children. Monday's a day off for me, typically. And this is... Part of my day on Monday is, a good segment of my day is most of my kids will call me on Monday just to chat or maybe they've got a question about something and they just want to hear my voice or I get a chance to a video conference, video call with my grandkids and be able to see them and uh, what a thrill that is. I love my children and I want my children to be happy and I want my children to be prosperous and I want my children to be healthy. But most of all, I want my children to be chosen of God to do a work for Him. The American dream has been stated in part as this. The dream that our children will be more blessed than we. The dream for our children to prosper. The dream for our children to have and to do and to, and to be. As a younger man, my dreams were of myself. My dreams were of what is God going to do with my life? Oh God, help me. God, and not necessarily in a selfish way, but I want to say something to you now that I'm, I'm approaching the age of 60. I'm 57 years old. I'll be 58 on May 27th. Just throwing that out there in case anybody's interested. Uh, on May 27th, I'll be 58 years old. Uh, I, I'm, I, it's no longer my earnest First level prayer, oh God, choose me. Oh God, let me. Oh God, use me. This is my, this is my prayer. It's a, my heart's cry is, oh God, choose my children. Oh God, use my family. Oh God, bless my grandchildren. King Hezekiah was a a very blessed man in many ways, but he also, toward the end of his life, acted foolishly and 
brought the Babylonians in to see all that he had, all the wealth, all the possessions that he had. And the inference in scripture, I read it this morning, the inference in scripture is that he was bragging, that he was, uh, that he was showing them how, uh, how affluent he was and how powerful he was. And so he was showing them everything that he had. And the prophet came and said to him, all of this is gonna be in their hands and you're going to die. And King Hezekiah, the Bible says that he turned himself and prayed earnestly. And God granted to him 15 more years of life. And then he made this statement when the prophet told him that God had granted him 15 more years of life. He made this statement, which is to me causes me to shudder. He said, is it not good if peace and truth be in my days? We see that in 2 Kings chapter 20. See, what the prophet had done is he told him, no, the penalty for your behavior will not be levied upon you personally. But after 15 more years, you have 15 more years of life. But after you're dead, it will be leveled in, uh, be leveled down upon uh, your children. And Hezekiah seemed to be okay with that. Does anybody know who the son of Hezekiah was? It was Manasseh. And he was one of the most evil, vile kings to ever reign in Judah. And not, not only that, he reigned for 50 years. He had a long reign and it was a wicked, evil reign. And we see what happened here eventually. The Babylonians came in and took it all. Even ultimately bringing the whole nation into captivity in Babylon. Oh God, Sure, I want your blessing. But greater is my desire that you would bless my children, that you would choose my children. We see of Rufus in Romans chapter 16, in verse 13, salute Rufus, chosen in the Lord. So here's the question that we're going to ask today. Is the Rufus of Romans chapter 16 the same as the son of Simon in Mark chapter 15? And I did a little research on this, and please, uh, uh, the, these truths that I'm going to give you are going to be relevant one way or another. But I, I did study this out a little bit. But I think that the timing is right for the Rufus of Romans 16 to be the same as the son of Simon, the brother of Alexander, the Rufus in Mark chapter 15. I believe the timing is right. The book of Romans was written about 25 years after the events of Simon carrying the cross. Now, if they were there from Cyrene, it would be fair to say that, that, uh, that Rufus would have been, the son of Simon would have been, oh, 10, 12, 14 years old. Let's say he was 14 years old. And the book of Romans was written about 25 years after those events. That would have made Rufus to be about 40 years old. That would have given him plenty of time to be established in the church there in Rome. By that, by that time, Rufus could have been known as a leader in the work of God. Now, the book of Mark was written about AD 67, which was about 37 years after the events of Mark chapter 15. So when the, the, the writer of the book of Mark says that 
He was the father, that Simon was the father of Alexander and Rufus. What he was saying, if you look at this, it appears as if he expected people to know who Rufus and Alexander were. So if it's 30 years later, 35 years later, almost 40 years later, Rufus would have been a mature man, having been in the prime of his life and at the pinnacle of his opportunity, the pinnacle of his strength. So the timing makes sense that this could be the same Rufus. The book of the Bible right was right. So the timing was right. I think the book of the Bible is right when you see it written in the book of Mark. The book of Mark uh, has to do with Gentiles and a persuasive writing to be able to encourage Gentiles to trust Christ. The book of Mark uh, doesn't deal with the genealogy of Christ. In a way, it starts like John does. It doesn't give a genealogy because it, it's written to Gentiles. Gentiles didn't care about the genealogies. Over and over in the book of Mark, you see explanations of Jewish customs. Well, a Jew would already know those things, but a Gentile would not. So there's an explanation of some of these customs. I believe that the book of Mark, having been written to Gentiles, was the book of the Bible that God used to delineate the fact that Rufus and Alexander were the sons of Simon. And I believe that links it with the book of Romans, which was primarily a Gentile church in Rome. Now here's some other thoughts. Do I, why do I believe that they're the same? Romans, uh, uh, Rufus in Romans chapter 16 and Rufus in Mark chapter 15. Now, these are just some sketchy things that we know. We don't know a lot of details. And we can also uh, go to uh, history to see some things and uh, historical events and accountings. Simon was from Cyrene. Now, if you look it up on an ancient map, you'll see that Cyrene is in Eastern Libya in North Africa. So if Simon was a native of Cyrene, and there was a lot of cosmopolitan uh, world there where different people had moved to different places around the Mediterranean. But if he was a native of Cyrene, that would make Simon a man of color, very likely a black man. Rufus, the name Rufus, according to A.T. Robinson, who uh, did great word studies in the Bible and also studied these names out, A.T. Robinson said this, that Rufus was a name common among slaves. So the potential is that the family of Simon with his sons, Alexander and Rufus, and then his wife, who is mentioned in Acts chapter 16, were a black family from North Africa who potentially had some association as slaves. Now, the Bible doesn't specifically say that, but we can historically start weaving start weaving a, 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 you see a pattern going on as we look at this narrative. What else about them? I'm going to look this up. I want to read it to you. Look at Acts chapter 2 and verse 10. Acts chapter 2 in verse 10. And this is talking about Pentecost. And at Pentecost, we know that there were folks from all over the world that were there for the Passover in, in Jerusalem. In Acts chapter 2 in verse 10, look in verse uh, 9. Uh, Parthians, Parthians and Medes and Elamites and the dwellers in Mesopotamia and in Judea and Cappadocia in Pontus and Asia. It's listing where all these people were from that heard the gospel. Phrygia and Pamphylia in Egypt and in the parts of Libya about Cyrene and strangers of Rome, 
Jews and proselytes and so on. Did you see that in verse 10? It said, and in the parts of Libya about Cyrene. That's pretty specific. When you can make note of any place on the then known world to narrow this thing down to say not only Cyrene, I mean, excuse me, not only, uh, 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 not, not only Libya, but a certain part of Libya known as Cyrene. I don't believe that we're stretching things very far to be able to say that the family of Simon, who was compelled to carry the cross of Christ, was a family of color who were proselytes to the Jewish faith and possibly there in service of another person. And that they heard the gospel at Pentecost and received Christ. I don't think that that's too far fetched to think. Very likely they were converted on the day of Pentecost. You talk about first fruits. They were there. They, they heard Peter preach his message. They were there. And I believe that they responded to that message. Now, I'm going to get to a point here in just a moment. Now, Cyrene became a stronghold of Christianity. Like a hundred years later, after the dispersion of the Jews and other things taking place and, and the Roman Empire having spread, and 150 years later, 200 years later, Cyrene was a stronghold of the Christian faith. God chose Rufus from this heritage. He chose him. Chose him for what? I don't know. But the Bible says in Romans, uh, in the book of Romans chapter 16, that he was chosen, salute Rufus, chosen in the Lord. And this is what I say. Oh God, oh God, if you can choose Simon's son, could you not choose my son? God, if you could choose Simon's son, Rufus, could you not choose my daughters? God, if you could choose this one, this one from Cyrene, could you not choose my sons-in-law, my daughter-in-law, and my grandchildren? Oh God, that's my heart's prayer. That's my heart's prayer. Folks, folks, sincerely, Sincerely, and those of you that are grandparents, you know exactly what I'm, my prayers anymore are little about myself and much about my children and my grandchildren. Oh God, choose them. Oh God, if you're gonna bless somebody, please bless my children. Oh God, if you're gonna choose somebody for honored service, please choose my grandchildren. Uh, please God, choose my children. God chose Rufus in chapter 16 of Romans. But he first chose Simon in Mark chapter 15. I don't know. I can only imagine what it was like that day. As the perfect Savior, Jesus Christ, along with the two malefactors that he was very soon going to be hung between, were carrying their crosses down the street in Jerusalem, open to shame and mockery. I wonder how many people curse them. I wonder how many people threw dirt at them or kicked at them or buffeted them as they went down the street. And Jesus, so weak from his beating, bloodletting, and the, the, the whole moment, the draining of his emotions, could no longer bear his cross. And there stood Simon. Simon. 
And beside him, his two sons, Rufus and Alexander. And I picture a Roman soldier pointing to him and say, you, you carry his cross. I don't know what he said. I don't know what he thought. But he carried the cross. Do you think that was an accident? I don't think that was an accident. As orchestrated as the entire scene of the crucifixion was, God did not have this happen by chance. God had chosen Simon. Simon very likely came in contact with the actual body of Christ. He probably, as he was taking the cross, had to take it off of Christ's back as he lay there on the street because he couldn't carry it. I don't know what he said. I don't know what Jesus said to him. But as he lifted that cross and put it on his own shoulder and began to carry it down the street, the very blood of Christ was dripping on him, was rubbing against his cheek, falling on his shoulder, running down his side. The very blood of Christ God first chose Simon. And we think that must have been that must have been such a humiliating experience. I don't know what Simon thought right at that moment. We can't say that. But if these other things are true, Simon, the rest of his life, looked back at that moment as the apex of his service as he carried the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. My attitude toward service has a tremendous effect on my children's attitude toward service. Remember the Family Life Conference I think of Simon carrying the cross, but I don't know, just not necessarily just Simon. If this is true, and this is Simon's family in Romans chapter 16, perhaps Simon has already passed on. Uh, I don't know. But we see in verse 13, so Rufus chosen in the Lord and his mother and mine. That tells me that the apostle Paul considered Rufus's mother to be like his own. I got some folks out there that, uh, young people that call me dad. I've been privileged to walk a couple of very special young ladies who are very dear to me down the aisle in place of their father. And it's just one of the honors, honors, overwhelming honors of my life. The apostle Paul had somebody that was like a mother to him. And that was Rufus' mother. Now picture this. And it seems like in a racially energized society that we're in, very, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> Rona, very likely the lady that the Apostle Paul considered like his mother was a black lady. Thank God, thank God that Christians come in all shapes and sizes and uh, in a uh, male and female and uh, in uh, different races. Some of the most honorable Christians I've ever met in my life are from another country. They're not even Americans. I'm so thankful that God uh, doesn't look down and see me as a white male. He looks down and sees me as one of his children. I'm glad that God is colorblind. So we have Simon who carried his cross and Simon's wife, who was a servant to the apostle Paul, served him like a mother would serve a son. That tells me today that my attitude towards service will affect my children's attitude towards service. In Mark chapter 15, none of us could uh, say otherwise. Simon 
had a personal experience, a personal encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ. Would not be difficult to assume that it changed his life. So today, as an application, dad's personal encounter with Christ will affect the family's encounter with Jesus Christ, personal encounter. Hey, get this now, get this. We all know it, parents. We, uh, it's part of parenting that we don't really like. And that is our kids know our strengths and they know our weaknesses. Until they're married, they don't know anyone as intimately as they know mom and dad. They see us, uh, they see us when we're a mess. They see us when we're fixed up. They see us when we're angry. They see us when we're not. They, uh, they, they see us uh, in our interactions. They hear our conversations. Uh, they know, they know. They sometimes even hear our intimate private conversations. When we think nobody else is listening, a child often is listening. We used to have a vent in the floor to let the heat up in the second story of our house when we lived in Millersburg, Michigan. And the kids now tell stories about when we would send them to bed. And of course, that's when you get out the popcorn, you get out the ice cream, uh, you watch a movie, uh, uh, you know. And uh, so they would all gather around that vent and look down to see what they could see. Okay, see what kind of ice cream mom and dad are having now. Oh, listen, they're having popcorn. And uh, I just hope that mom and I said, uh, uh, said the right kind of things because kids were listening. You know, kids don't wait until we get our act together. They're learning from us every, every, with every interaction that they have. Dad's personal encounter, Simon's personal en encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ affected Rufus's relationship to Jesus Christ. Secondly, today, don't expect our children to have a spirit worthy of being chosen if we refuse to serve. I think we sometimes have the wrong idea, men, about masculinity. I think we, we sometimes get that old chest beating kind of thing and Tarzan thing and uh, I'm the boss and I'm the king and you're going to do what I tell you to do because why? Because I'm the dad, I'm the, I'm the husband, I'm, I'm the ruler of this kingdom. I have my kingdom here and I'm going to sit on my couch and I'm going to scratch my belly and I'm going to belch if I want to and you're going to do what I tell you to do. And don't do as I do, as I do, do as I say. Now you tell me how good is that going for you, Bubba? How's that going for you? Don't expect our children to have a spirit worthy of being chosen if we refuse to serve. Both Simon and his wife were servants. They weren't ashamed of being servants. I believe that we can see that woven through scripture here. Proverbs 23, 26, take the time to look there. Proverbs 23 and 26 says this, my son, give me thine heart and let thine eyes observe my ways. This is a key verse for parenting. I've got written in the margin of my Bible. Proverbs 23, 26, my son, give me thine heart, let thine eyes observe my ways. Don't expect our children to have a spirit worthy of being chosen if we refuse to serve. The greatest thing a man can do is to serve another. The greatest exercise of strength is to be kind to someone who is weak. The greatest establishment of financial, of financial freedom is when we choose to give alms to those that are in need, not looking for thanks, not looking for recognition. It's a spirit that's worthy to be chosen by God. And guess who's watching? The kids are watching. I used to go with my dad on Sunday morning right after the morning service at Bethel Baptist in Manistique, in the Upper Peninsula, Michigan. And uh, he said, come with me, son. 
and we would go to the coat rack, which is right by the door of that old church building. Used to be there anyway. And as people would be going out, my dad would wait and he'd see one of our elderly ladies coming and he would take her coat off the rack and he would hold it for her and help her with her coat. And as I grew older, he was expecting me to do the same. He said, son, let's go, let's go help ladies with their coats. And there'd be times he'd say, here, son, take, uh, oh, uh, uh, Miss, uh, Miss Anderson and walk her to her car. And I learned how to stick my elbow out like this to have a lady be able to grab a hold of, that, of my elbow, an elderly lady, and to walk slowly to the car and open the door for her. You know who taught me that? My dad taught me that. My dad taught me that by example. What can we do to help establish the spirit of excellence in our children, which would make them, uh, make them uh, be part of God's chosen? Once that God chooses, it doesn't say what he chose Rufus for. I don't know. But how about this, folks? Don't wait to be asked. Volunteer. Volunteer. Say, well, I'm just not, I've, I've never included anything down there at that church. Well, I'll tell you what, volunteer. Volunteer. I'm not talking about a platform responsibility. I'm talking about behind the scenes when nobody knows what's going on. You'll do more to train your children to be servants of God if you'll do things that are not in front of people that nobody else knows about, but the kids know. Oh, remember at the, uh, the turning the water into wine, the wedding uh, feast at Cana in Galilee? And when Jesus performed that miracle, nobody outside knew what was going on. The only ones that really knew were the servants. They're the only ones that knew. So, being a servant gets you into close quarters with the Lord Jesus Christ. So don't expect our children to have a spirit worthy of being chosen if we refuse to serve. Volunteer. Walk humbly. Walk humbly. Downplay recognition. The scripture says that in honor, preferring one another. Now, what I think that verse means, in honor preferring one another, means if somebody is going to get honor, let it be somebody else, and I want to applaud them. I ought to develop that in my heart that I get the satisfaction, I get satisfaction from recognizing somebody else's uh, somebody else's accomplishment or achievement or labor, rather than standing around waiting for somebody to clap for me. That's a bad situation when you're waiting for somebody to clap for you because it rarely happens when you're looking for it. So when you walk humbly, when you downplay recognition, we're setting our children up for success in the eyes of God. Serve in obscurity if you can. Serve in obscurity as much as possible. If you're going to give, rather than standing up and taking your money out, and waving your money in the air so everybody can see it and make the big gesture, put that in the offering plate. How about doing alms in secret? Rather than sounding your own trumpet, tooting your own horn, how about just keeping your mouth quiet, keeping your words few, and when you see a need, slip some money in an envelope, don't even put your name on it, and put it in that person's Bible or have a third party go and deliver to that, that to that person. But do this. Let your kids know what you're doing. What's happening? Like Rufus, who was able to stand back and watch his mother serve the Apostle Paul. And then also with the memory of standing beside his father as he stooped down and picked up the cross of Christ, he learned to be a servant. So dad's personal encounter affects the family. And then secondly, don't expect your children to have a spirit worthy of being chosen if we refuse to serve. Thirdly, Privately praise your children on God's behalf. Proverbs 18.21 says, as the, as the finding pot 
for silver and the furnace for gold, so is a man to his praise. Praise has a refining, uh, is a refining activity. Uh, there's a way we say, well, but you don't want to praise them too much because then they'll expect it. You just do it because you're supposed to. Well, there is some truth to that. And there's some merit to that thought. But folks, what you're trying to do is raise your kids. So when you see your little child doing something, sharing a toy, just stop the world. Stop the world because that's not in the nature of the children to share their toy. Stop the world and just say, oh, son, I saw what you just did. Oh, oh my, you are, you are so generous. You are so kind. Come here, give me a hug. What we're doing is reinforcing good behavior. Praise them on God's behalf. Eventually, as we mature in our walk and we get some years behind us, we understand when God is pleased with us. As a child or even a young person, many times that is not an understanding when God is pleased. So step in on God's behalf. That's part of parenting. That's what a mature Christian is supposed to do. Step in. And when you see something that is praiseworthy, you don't have to get in and praise them in front of the whole church. Just take them aside and say, son, I saw that. Sweetheart, I saw the way you treated that young lady. I saw the way you treated that elderly person. I saw what you did there. I saw that you jumped in and helped. I saw the way that you just assisted when somebody needed help. You just jumped up and did it. Thank you so much. You know something? God sees that. So privately praise them on God's behalf. This establishes a feeling of worth in our children. A feeling of worth. So they're going to get proud. Oh, there is a whole big difference between a feeling of worth and a feeling of pride. A feeling of value, meaning I can make a difference. I can do something. I can be a help. Oh, God. Oh, God. Choose my children to be a help. Well, if I want my children to be a help, God is urging me as a parent to step in and give them words of encouragement, words, private words of praise when I see that they're doing something right. It establishes a feeling of worth. It emphasizes inner satisfaction, meaning I don't need everybody out there to applaud me. I just need to know that I've done what's right. I just need to know that God is pleased with me. And here's a great one. I need to know that my dad is pleased with me. I need to know that my mother is pleased with me. We're very quick to make sure to let them know when we're not pleased. Let's be even more quick. Let's, even, let's, let's be snappier to be able to let them know when we are pleased. Words, uh, 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 death and life are in the power of the tongue. The Bible says, either we're cutting down or we're building up. So privately praise them on God's behalf, establishing their worth, their self-worth, and emphasizing inner satisfaction rather than outward reward. Then finally, in closing here today, number four, establish family customs that seek out the needs of others. Establish family customs that seek out the needs of others. One of the things I am most pleased about with my children is I believe that all five of my children have a heart, have a heart for others. I've watched my kids work on bus routes. Matter of fact, there's a couple of kids, two or three kids in a little town out in the middle of nowhere in Iowa. who my daughter and son-in-law made sure that they had Christmas for the last several years. And one time they were late getting there. It was on Christmas Day, I believe it was, that they dropped off the presents later in the afternoon. And what they didn't realize before then is those kids were sitting there watching out the window, maybe even in their heart, afraid that maybe they'd been forgotten. Because whatever they brought to them, to those children, that's what they got for Christmas. Oh, that makes my heart swell as a dad. 
I've watched my children give out of their poverty. Give out of their poverty. I'm so glad they're not driven by material things. I'm so glad of that. What I would like to think, what I would like to hope is maybe, maybe my wife and I had some small part in being able to develop that in their life. Establish family customs that seek out the needs of others. Find somebody who needs more help and give it to them. Get together with your children. Help them pick out presents for somebody else for Christmas. When they come to you and they start observing that somebody has a need, or maybe somebody that can't go to an activity because they don't have enough money or, or something like that. Find a way to encourage your kids, uh, maybe by doing something together to make a little bit of money, to be able to help pay another kid's way to camp. Establish family customs that seek out the needs of others. Here we have a family that stretches from Mark chapter 15 to Romans chapter 16. In Mark chapter 15, we see Simon, we see Alexander, and we see Rufus. And then in uh, Romans chapter 16, we see Rufus, who was chosen of the Lord. And then Mom, who was like a mother to the Apostle Paul. Oh, folks, oh, folks, we want our kids to be blessed by God, don't we? We want them to be chosen by God for unique service. It starts with us. Let's pray together. Father, help us, dear God. Help us to recognize the importance of parenting, importance of the family unit in promoting godly living. Oh God, choose my children. Bless them, oh God. Oh God, bless my grandchildren, the world that they're gonna grow up in, God. I just can't even imagine it. Oh God, bless them. Choose them for service. Oh God, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. God bless you, folks. Thank you for watching the first night of our family conference. I just wanted to take a quick moment to remind you that our question and answer session with Brother Jones and Brother Keenan is tomorrow night at 6.30. So if you have a question that you'd like to ask them, if you could do us a favor and take a moment, write it down, and then send it to us right now. That way we can have it ready for them tomorrow night. You can send it to Pastor Lou, Miss Jessica, or myself, and we'll make sure we have those questions ready. Thanks for watching, and have a wonderful evening.